Welcome to the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum. The ISF Podcast is hosted by ISF CEO Steve Durbin, and every episode he brings listeners features timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm producer Tavia Gilbert. Today is the first of a two-part conversation between Steve and Dr. Christopher Hand. Chris is a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. He and Steve talk about trust and authenticity online, cyberbullying in the context of work, and what we know so far about the decision to return to the office post-pandemic. So Chris, thanks very much indeed for joining me on the podcast. What I wanted to talk to you about today was, in essence, online human behavior. So at the ISF, we've seen a lot of interest recently in what we call human-centered security. But really, that is all about, I think, how you, myself, others behave when we go online. And you're something of, a, of an expert in that space. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting your take on what we can do better and some of the pitfalls that are out there for us to avoid. Perhaps we could start with really talking about the whole rise, I suppose, of social media. Some people might describe it as an obsession or fascination. What's your take on that? I think one of the things that makes me so interested in this area is the individuality of people's usage pattern and experiences. I think it's a very rich area and I think there's great diversity in people's motivations for engaging with social media and indeed how closely people behave to their their real world selves as their online selves, whereas others behave really quite differently in the online space. I think there is maybe a misperception around people's behaviours online in that we don't quite understand enough yet about things like the consistency of behaviour online, the authenticity of behaviour online and its its relationship with the, the real world self. So I think there's still so much we have to understand. It's still an area of great development and great intrigue. And for me, I think one of the things that makes it so interesting is that we increasingly see real world consequences for people's behaviour online, both positively and negatively. You talked there about authenticity Trust, obviously, is is one of the major things that businesses, that relationships are built upon. And increasingly, we're seeing more and more of those relationships starting out and then further developing via social media. So if we've got a big issue with authenticity, what does that really say about the kinds of relationship and the trust paradigm that we're creating? Trust is, is very important. Trust is very important in any relationship. And I think in the online space, how we develop trust between individuals is intriguing because there is always a hint of an element of doubt about whether or not someone is being authentic and open and honest in how they present themselves, more so in the online space than perhaps in the real world space. I think understanding how those trust relationships develop is important. We see that a lot in things like online romance fraud and and other types of fraud, uh, catfishing. So I think how we support users and employers, contractors, professionals to safely develop trust and develop a transparent trust is is a big area of interest. And how might we do that? Give us some examples. I think one thing that stands out to me is understanding why people might legitimately choose to present under a different name or identity. There are lots of very valid reasons why someone might not use their real name or their real identity in the online space. For example, people who have maybe been victims of intimate partner abuse or people who have been stalked, people who are in witness protection initiatives. It's very important that those people have a safe space and a safe way to present under a pseudonym or under a slightly different identity. One thing that worries me is because there is so much negative attention towards alternative presentations in the online space that we forget that there are often very valid reasons why people need to present under an alternative avatar or an alternative name. 
And I think supporting people first and foremost to understand that there is legitimacy to some of those presentations is, is really important. In terms of the more negative ways that, that people present unauthentically or present under aliases, supporting people to ask the right questions, um, giving people the tools from quite an early age, whether this is in the, the private domain or in, in an employment context, to ask the right questions about people, supporting people to understand how to do sort of safety checks, I guess, to, to try and understand more about who they're talking to is important because we have seen, unfortunately, many, many cases where people have been defrauded either in their personal lives or their professional lives. But education is the key, training is the key, and also treating people with dignity, people who have been victimised, allowing them safety and a space to come forward without judgement, with understanding, to help others learn from their mistakes. I think the tendency to victim blame is quite high, and I think it's very difficult for people to come forward when they have been victimised because they're maybe afraid of, of being judged or they're afraid of not receiving sympathy or, or they're seen to have precipitated their own victimization. This concept of victim blaming is is an interesting one because of course again if I take that into the corporate environment, you know, one of the things that we are always trying to get people to do is to put their hand up when there is a problem. You know, if they have you know opened the wrong link or they have been involved in in some of the things you've just been talking about. So, how can we? I think I use the words you know education quite a lot. How can we better educate on both sides, the abused party and the employer in this instance, to set aside some of that judgment? What are some of the key things that we can do in that space? Again, I think alerting people to why we victim blame and, and making people aware of, of why good people will still blame the victim is an important thing. Victim blaming is a little bit of a defence mechanism, and particularly if we see ourselves as similar to the victim. So in the workplace, if you've got a team of employees who have come from similar backgrounds, similar status, similar kind of day-to-day behaviours, and someone makes a mistake and falls victim to anything, it's natural for us to blame them because we don't want the same thing to happen to us. We have a tendency to look to that victim and think there must be something in their character or their makeup that makes them a victim, you know, that makes them responsible for whatever happened to them because we don't want the same thing to happen to us. So I think making people aware that the victim blaming is quite a natural kind of psychological defence mechanism can then help us put the brakes on when we are tempted to victim blame and, and, and stop for a moment, think about the situational factors rather than the individual factors, think about the sophistication of some of these scams and some of the very complex relationship building that goes into tricking people into falling into these scams, as well as making people aware of you know the cognitively busy environments that people are working in. It is quite easy to make one of these mistakes, particularly when they rely on a day-to-day behaviour like clicking on a link or opening an attachment. You know, these are, are very well ingrained daily behaviours in many workplaces. So it's understandable that scammers would use them uh, to try and defraud someone or to extract information, to exploit vulnerabilities. But, you know, victim blaming in itself is a very common thing that we do, partly to defend ourselves psychologically. So I think as well, having a safe space for people to come forward I mean, there's often a fear of reprisal. There's maybe a fear for job safety. Um, I think making sure that people have access to the right structures in which to appropriately flag up when mistakes have been made is very important because we can learn from our mistakes. And obviously, you know, it's a very distressing thing for a colleague or a friend to make one of these mistakes. So that individual needs to be supported. And and you haven't used the word, but other people that I've I've spoken to on this topic certainly have, and that is of the experience being described as traumatic. Yes. And that sparking off a whole range of post-trauma related uh, responses. Absolutely. And again, the individual responses to these incidents can be hugely variable, but the idea of trauma is a really important one. In many cases, 
the consequences are quite serious in, in terms of the initial mistake that's made. And absolutely, the person feels violated, they feel traumatised, depending on the nature of the incident. And again, like other forms of trauma, it's very important that we get the right support to those individuals early because the consequences can be absolutely dire and long-lasting. But very often, Chris, the people who are experiencing that trauma perhaps don't are not able to identify it. So for, from an employer's perspective, again, what are the sorts of things that we can do to spot some of those things, first of all? And secondly, what are the sorts of support mechanisms that we should consider putting in place in, in the workplace to help people overcome these kinds of uh, traumatic situations that they might find themselves in? I think in terms of building support systems, having appropriate training for the people who are going to provide the support is crucial. Some people might talk about things like peer-to-peer networking or peer-to-peer mentoring, but the, the people who would be in those roles would have to be adequately trained and supported themselves because we don't want to run the risk of vicarious trauma where someone is traumatized by learning about the traumatic experiences of others. I think we need to be really careful about exposing ourselves and our colleagues to that kind of negativity. But again, it comes back to giving people time and space to engage with their colleagues, to notice changes in their behaviour, to notice markers of trauma or stress, and then to be able to feel empowered to provide the right support or even feel empowered to comment because sometimes it can feel quite invasive or it might feel like stepping across a boundary to suggest to someone that they need help. Help seeking is still something that we're trying to understand better. We're, we're trying to understand when and when people will not come forward for help seeking or when and when people will not seek help. We're also still trying to understand the best ways to support people in terms of complex trauma. Um, often people are dealing with multiple traumas. And again, that's something that we need to, to understand whether we're dealing with something isolated or whether it's part of a larger picture. And again, unfortunately, a lot of this comes back to having the time and the resources to do it, but it needs to be a priority because the human and operational costs can be tremendous if there aren't adequate support mechanisms in place. And and I suppose one of the other things from the individual perspective too is to try to identify what might trigger some of the trauma again because obviously if you're an employer and you keep putting the person that has been a victim into a similar situation over and over again you're just exacerbating it making very much worse aren't you absolutely and ethically and operationally it can be quite difficult because people are often reluctant to disclose things that think that they might be treated differently so for example if someone has a personal circumstance or a a historic circumstance that might leave them vulnerable to re-victimization or or traumatization they might be disinclined to share it because they think it might affect perceptions of them you know they're worried that people might treat them differently they're worried they might not have a quality of opportunity so there's this horrible kind of double-edged sword where we need to know more information in order to provide the right support and make sure that we don't expose people to inappropriate tasks or materials and yet at the same time simply asking for that information can be quite traumatizing for some people it can cause a lot of mental discomfort because people are potentially worried about being discriminated against simply because of the disclosure of a past history of a certain circumstance. So there's this kind of complicated dance that goes around between trying to inform people about why we need their information, about why we need to know more about them so that we can support them more appropriately and give them the right opportunities and simultaneously reassuring them that they're not going to have that information used against them. You made the point as well, uh, rightly, that a lot of this does require time. It does require resource on the part of the employer. Obviously, certainly in the UK, but in other parts of the world as well, at the moment, a lot of businesses are finding it extremely, extremely tough. Some of them making cutbacks. And so I suppose there'd be a number of people listening to this thinking to themselves, well, yes, that's all well and good. And if I had the time and the resource, I'd probably be inclined to... uh, 
to do some of the things that Chris is talking about. But during a, a sort of a down economy where things are uh, a little bit tougher financially, resource-wise, what are some of the simple things that an employer, for instance, might be able to do in this area that would have a positive impact? Taking feedback from employees is very important and having suitable feedback structures in place within the organisation is very helpful. You know, if you can listen to what your employees and your colleagues are telling you and then find a way to enact upon that feedback, that's helpful. You know, individual employees will generally have a good understanding of what is realistic for their organisation to do, given all the constraints that it's facing. So I think listening to the employees about what might be an effective strategy for them is helpful. It does go beyond the employer. You know, that this is something that we're dealing with at a global societal level. You know, these challenges around well-being, particularly in digital spaces, go beyond individual employers. And, it, you know, it's getting to the point that we need to kind of treat these issues on a par with issues of physical health. We need to train people in order to operate effectively in these digital spaces in the way that we train literacy and numeracy. This is not just for now, but it's also for the future. So it's important that we have open conversations with our employees about what their needs are. We have feedback mechanisms that enable representative feedback to be gathered from diverse members of the team and multiple levels of the teams and organisations. But ultimately, you need to close that feedback loop. You know, there has to be some sort of outcome. And whether that is around flexible working, whether it's around benefit packages, whether it's around opportunities for advancement, whether or not it's about feeling that there are opportunities to rescale or upscale within an organisation, that's, you know, different individuals will have different perspectives on that. But I think one thing that is hurting people at the moment is that they don't even necessarily have the time and space to know what it is that they want or know what it is that they need. Um, it's, it's difficult for people at all levels of organisations and institutions at the moment. Um, we're living in globally very, very challenging times, really challenging times. We're coming off the back of a pandemic. People are mentally and physically drained after the last few years economically circumstances are very poor for a large number of people and the outlook doesn't look particularly good and when people don't seem to have a lot of hope that's when things get really bad so we're facing a number of really complicated intertwined pressures and challenges and unfortunately the one thing that we really need which is time is the one thing that is in the shortest supply at the moment and you mentioned the pandemic there. I mean, obviously, for a lot of people, a lot of businesses, that marked a significant shift in the way in which people work. We moved a lot of people into um, a work-from-home environment, and very many, my own organization included, haven't returned to that uh, office-based way of working, uh, having gone down perhaps a hybrid route or, or have stayed permanently as uh, working from home first. In the sorts of areas we've just been talking about here with online behaviour and some of the challenges of that, what is your view of that remote working? Does it help or does it actually make matters worse? Again, this is such a hot issue. And the interesting thing, I suppose, is that the pandemic created a situation that we would never have really been able to experimentally manipulate or we would never have been able to operationalize on the scale that has happened. And we're still learning about the most effective ways to move through this. But again, like so many other things, the individuality of people's experiences is remarkable. And there's a real diversity in what people want from home working and what people want from hybrid and what people want from the return to the office space. I think it's complicated at the moment because of the economic pressures that people are under. And for some people, they might not understand their true preferences yet because of the economic pressures of maybe commuting or having to eat outside the home on days that they're, they're not able to work from home. And again, similarly, a lot of people who are predominantly working outside might see working at home as more desirable because they might perceive, you know, a cost benefit. Um, it's it's such a fascinating thing because there's the idea of socialisation, 
But again, that depends on your home environment. You know, the social environment for someone working at home with three unrelated flatmates might be very different from the person who works at home alone. And indeed, the person that works at home alone might actually prefer that if they don't particularly favour social interaction among their work colleagues. So I think what worries me is that in the lay community, in the general public, there are really ingrained perceptions about office working and about home working. And we don't quite understand them enough yet. We don't quite understand how well those kind of stereotypes are actually borne out by data. Productivity, we don't probably don't have enough data yet on, on whether or not there have been long-term benefits of working from home or working under mixed models or indeed of return to office. But again, I think understanding people's kind of psychological makeup and understanding what their domestic circumstances are helps. But at the same time, you're then starting to get into ethically dubious territory between how much data do you need, how invasive does your questioning need to be in order to understand that person to provide the right kind of support. And again, separating one's personal feelings out of it is quite difficult because I think we all have quite strong opinions about what works best for us. And it's hard not to maybe try and generalise that to people who are like us or do similar jobs. It can be really difficult for us to make informed decisions while taking our kind of personal biases towards ways of working out of the equation. We'll be back next week with the second part of Steve's conversation with Dr. Christopher Hand. In the meantime, we ask listeners that you take 10 seconds to pull up this podcast on whatever device you're listening and give us a five-star rating and a quick review. You can also listen to the ISF Analyst Insight podcast, which goes in-depth on the hottest topics in information security. In every episode, ISF analysts hand-select active security professionals from ISF member organizations to discuss how the implementation of ISF research is uniquely applied to their real-world context. We hope you'll listen, and of course, we'll put a link to that show in our show notes. If there's a topic or question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find our catalog of past video and podcast episodes as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with senior producer Katie Flood, mix and master by Kayla Elrod, music by Alexander Filipiak. Thanks for listening. <laughs>